No, it's a pleasure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for the invite. So yeah, so obviously this is a this is a paper I'll be presenting. So this um this is actually work um done at UCL in London, but also in, in collaboration with uh, uh Brian Ingalls group at the University of Waterloo. Um so because maybe if I can there we go. So because maybe uh this work is kind of slightly different um from stuff that usually gets presented. So I don't work in kind of a, an ML lab specifically. Um, so I thought I'd give, well, we discussed giving kind of a, give an overview of the wider context. So um, just to give me, give you kind of a introduction to myself. So I'm currently a postdoc in the computational systems and synthetic biology lab at University College London. Um, so this group is led by Prof Professor Chris Barnes. Um, and I also did my PhD there. Um, and then kind of, during my sort of uh, bachelor's and master's, I, I kind of had sort of a wide range of, uh, studied a wide range of things from physics, uh, molecular biology, and kind of um, more sort of computational stuff. So machine learning, data science and stuff like that. So um, I'm going to very, very briefly give you kind of an, an overview of synth synthetic biology, which is kind of the field that um, I work in. Then zoom in a little bit and give you a very brief overview of what we do in our lab and then zoom in a bit more and give you a, a very brief overview of kind of uh, my work and then obviously we will talk slightly more in depth uh, about this paper. Um, so kind of for those of you who don't know, so synthetic biology is basically a field where we we attempt to use kind of biology as an engineering substrate. So we, we want to design and build biological systems um, from the ground up and hopefully be able to um do something useful with those systems so the really cool thing about syntax biology is because um basically it's, it's, it's extremely interdisciplinary as you might imagine so um it's kind of this intersection between a lot of different fields and in, in my lab we have kind of um we've got physicists we've got engineers uh, computer scientists and then also kind of you know microbiologists and molecular biologists um i did also grow up on a farm so we've got a little bit of agriculture in there as well um yeah so so you know what we attempt to do in synthetic biology is to kind of design and build biological systems so um often we talk about this design build test learn cycle um so you know we will we will design something we will build it um due to kind of the inherent complexity of biology it will probably not work exactly how you wanted it to so we'll test it find out what works and what doesn't uh, we'll learn from that and then you know we'll we'll go back to the drawing board a bit and we'll iterate through this this process um so my work i'm kind of very much on kind of the computational side of this so i'm more in the design and learn um phase and then basically other people do the hard work and and, and build everything for me uh but uh you know the applications of being able to kind of manipulate and, and engineer with biology as you might imagine can be quite uh quite a, a wide array of things so for example in kind of biopharma if you can produce um so for example insulin right you can produce that with bacteria really well um you know you can produce biomolecules and things like that uh we also in our lab do a lot of kind of biosensing applications so can you can you engineer uh, bacteria to uh, kind of sense and respond to their environment um so a lot of our work is kind of uh, based around that and then you know we also have um a wide range of kind of applications. So in this slide, I just wanted to kind of get across that um, this is really quite difficult. And this is, is basically the thing I've learned. Um, so what we have here is kind of the, the known metabolism or the metabolic network of an E. coli cell. So E. coli is in theory quite a simple um, organism and we use it a lot in synthetic biology because it's, it's relatively well characterized. We know a lot about it and you know it's it's simple right but um as you can see it doesn't look simple at all right and um this is kind of one one of the things that you know became apparent to me learning kind of molecular biology and how how everything works is, is biology is extremely messy right these pathways are really really messy um and if you compare kind of biological systems to things that are human engineered um kind of human engineered systems you know they're they're kind of meant to be understood by humans right so um if you compare it to say like a, a watch uh right a watch is complex right but it's it's nothing like this so i like to compare um if you do kind of like a thought experiment if you were going to uh 
if you're going to produce an evolutionary algorithm to write a, a program using code and you know it works at the character level so it's mutating this this program at the character level and um uh optimizing it to perform a certain function that code is not going to look anything like a nice human written code that's, that's readable and other people can come in and work with um and there's that kind of kind of level of messiness that we're trying to sort of work with and manipulate here so um the first thing that kind of happened is a you know molecular biologist come along and um, they'll try and like understand these networks um and how, how they do that basically is you is you'll break things so you delete maybe a line of code see how that affects the, the function of it and then you can um try and understand how the system works like that and then synthetic biology is kind of like a level up from that or a step forward from that where we're trying to actually manipulate this and and add our own designs into this um into these organisms um but trying to you know as you might imagine trying to get such a complex system to kind of do exactly what you want is a very challenging task um so that's kind of why I think uh sort of machine learning methods might be very useful in that there's uh obviously this is a super hard problem for humans to do to kind of rationally engineer these systems um and then there's there's this kind of parsimony right and that a lot of machine learning methods are, are black boxes where we don't you know if you train a neural network to do something the classification task you don't necessarily know how exactly it works right and that's kind of you know kind of parsimonious to how um the actual process of natural selection um is also like a black box so the actual kind of genetic sequence is kind of like a black box right and um we don't necessarily always know it was very difficult to entangle how these uh how these things work um so this is kind of why i think machine learning methods might be really applicable as they can help help us with these really messy systems that are super hard for humans to understand um but there's obviously a lot of challenges is to this um so well, this comes down to the kind of complexity of, of biology. Um, a lot of the data, so a lot of the data we we work with is not always that great. Um, and there's there's kind of a lack of, you know, like data standards and kind of uh, biological measurements are not always, um, you know, they, they don't always have units. So they can always, they might always be in like arbitrary units. So you can't compare different data sets from different labs and things like that. Um, and you know people have tried to kind of solve this data problem by uh sort of creating data standards but they never really seem to stick um so I like to kind of think of the spectrum where we have kind of wet lab people on one side and more computational people on the other side and you have a load you have a spectrum of people in the middle what I think we really need to do is kind of increase like the sort of communication and collaboration across the spectrum so that you know people uh may be developing really advanced machine learning methods with like, a, you know, if you have a transformer with millions of parameters, they don't kind of like lose sight of the people that are actually in the labs and gathering the data. And equally, you know, if the people in the labs gathering data had a better understanding of kind of these quantitative methods, um, maybe they would have sort of a better awareness of, of, you know, why we need a better appreciation of why we need good data and maybe a better awareness of like, you know, how to, how to do that. Uh, so, Actually, in UCL, we have kind of uh, quite a good uh, sort of track record of kind of interdisciplinary stuff. So training people in in the in the middle of this of this spectrum. Um, so it's quite interdisciplinary degrees, such as the one I did. And there we have these kind of um, sort of initiatives, so Sysmic and uh, L two D, uh, and these these are kind of um, courses that have been developed at UCL, and I've done um, a bit of teaching and. Uh, created some materials for, uh, which basically aim to take biology PhD students and teach them quantitative skills. And um, these, so Sysmic is used at quite a few UK universities now. Um, and I think this, these are really kind of good initiatives because I think this is super important that, you know, these two extremes don't kind of lose sight of each other. Um, otherwise, we're never going to solve these problems, really. Um, so just to give, again, very brief overview of what we do in the lab. So we have this is just ripped completely from the home page of the website. Uh, so these are kind of the four main group, four main areas we work on. So we have kind of mutational processes. So this is uh, basically cancer research, um, which I know close to nothing about, but they do um, they do some very cool stuff trying to understand um, 
you know, how, how cancers develop and things like that. And we have uh, kind of microbiome engineering. So this is, a lot of this is focused on kind of your gut microbiome, which is going to be um, hugely important. Um, so I've done a bit of work trying to model um, the kind of the, the dynamics of the gut microbiome. And this is where you really see that uh, when we don't have very much data and two, the data is not very good. Um, so this that makes this super, super challenging where, and it's, it's quite apparent that if, if the data is better, the problem wouldn't be that difficult to solve, I don't think. Um, and we also have kind of a gene regulatory network. So this is basically classical synthetic biology and kind of uh, engineering eco like to do to do stuff such as you know biosensing um sensing the environment and then we have this biological computing project which I've done a lot of work on um as well and uh the idea behind this is can we build biological systems that are capable of um basically complex information processing and can we make it easily programmable um so that's actually I'll give you a a, a quick overview of that so this is we're on to kind of the the stuff that I can actually talk about with some authority. Uh, so this is the stuff that I work on. Um, so the idea behind this is we will basically want to build biological computers. Um, so how you would do that traditionally in synthetic biology is for every any given function you want to build, you would have to design a genetic circuit to, um, to encode that function. And then you have to build that. And that is really quite non-trivial. Okay, so we were... We're kind of looking at it in a slightly different way and that we use kind of spatial patterning as a programming method. Um, so these are some very simple digital logic gates. So we have an OR gate and we have an AND gate. And these two gates use the same biological parts. So you can see uh, these are our inputs, A and B. And these are some uh, bacterial cells that respond to the inputs. And these inputs are diffusible molecules, which means the signal is distance dependent. Um, and basically the take home message is that uh, with the same parts, we can uh, basically just move move the uh, inputs relative to the kind of bacteria, and that gives us a different logic gate. Um, and then we can also do things like XOR. Um, and uh, so this is just the very simplest case where we've shown that actually it's uh, possible to do much more complex things. Um, and we have a design algorithm kind of based on if you know the espresso algorithm for from electronic um, circuit design, it's kind of inspired by that, which finds kind of the, the simplest way to program a given digital function. And then um, what you see on the background here is actually model predictions of the different functions and how they vary across space. So you also have kind of a quite well calibrated finite difference model, which allows us to um, uh, design the system, which is kind of what we're all about in synthetic biology is being able to kind of rationally design things and then build them and have them work. Um, so that's quite cool. And then the other kind of uh, strand of my research is kind of the more reinforcement learning based stuff that you will talk about. So I've got basically uh, the paper I'll talk about today and then a, another another paper, which I'll show you very briefly. So this was uh, based on the control of uh, bioreactors. So the reason we're kind of interested in this is if you're trying to you know produce a, a molecule, um, a biomolecule. Uh, if you're doing that in a in a single strain of bacteria, there's basically sort of a fundamental limitation of how how complex a metabolic pathway you can put in that bacteria before basically you overload the metabolic capabilities of the cell and it stops growing. Right. So one thing we're going to be interested in in the future is using multiple different populations of bacteria that you know we can break up a metabolic pathway and kind of um, these can cooperate together. Um, the problem with this is it becomes basically harder to control, right? It's just a more complex system. So we basically in, investigated uh, reinforcement learning other way around this, and we showed that you can, all in simulation, so we haven't implemented this yet, uh, you can optimize, say, a product output directly um, with kind of less, uh, less information about the system than you would require for more traditional, so MPC or, or PID type methods. And then also one thing we wanted to show was that you can do this in a realistically attainable amount of data. Um, so we showed you can learn like a good control policy in 24 hours if you have five bioreactors running in parallel, which is uh, actually very achievable. Um, yeah, and then I forgot the slide was in here, but that, that kind of all went into my thesis, which I completed um, earlier in the year. 
So that's just a very, very brief overview of kind of the context of this work and um, maybe slightly, slight, it might be slightly different from, from um, some of the stuff that other people do. Um, but yeah, so obviously what we're gonna be talking about today is this paper, um, so deep reinforcement learning for optimal experimental design in biology. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, by the way, you can you can just interrupt. Um, that's fine. So we already introduced this kind of design build test learn cycle. Um, so obviously, if we want to be able to uh, kind of design biological systems, a well calibrated model of how they function that we can then use to simulate um, before we actually build the system is obviously going to be very useful. Um, before we can um, uh, kind of use the model, we, we obviously need to actually learn the dynamics of the system, right? We need the model to be accurate, basically. Um, so this this uh, paper is kind of focused in, as most of my work is focused on, on this region of, of the cycle. Um, so we are here focusing on um, different, so models of differential equations. So if we have a system of differential equations, um, and the system, you know, the the behavior of the system is obviously is going to depend on the current state of the system, um, some unknown parameters, and kind of some inputs to the system. So if you can perturb the system in some way, um, and kind of quite a common thing is when we sort of structurally assume that we know uh, kind of the uh, we know the structural details of the model, um, but we don't know the parameters. So then the task is okay. Um, how do we find these parameters? Um, and yeah, so this is kind of should probably be quite familiar, but um, yeah, obviously the the model itself will will allow you to predict the output for a given input, and then to learn the parameters, we can do characterization experiments. Um, however, especially in biology, these experiments can be expensive. Um, which you know gives you the motivation to try and optimize these experiments right so if you can if you have a set fixed amount of experimental capacity um you want to perform the best experiment you can such that you get good parameter estimates right so um that's kind of what the field of optimal experimental design is about um so there's basically a few ways you could go about doing this so you, as a person in the lab, could come up with a um, characterization experiment, and you know that might work quite well. But kind of one of the things that I've realized in this work is sort of the the experiments that yield the most information are not always intuitive, and they kind of you know are not necessarily something that you as a human would um, would come up with. Um, then there's this kind of whole field of, of math. So there's a lot of mathematical techniques to do this, um, which we will talk about a little bit more. Um, and then kind of our approach is sort of applying, obviously, reinforcement learning to this. Um, so how, how um, this might work as in kind of like the, the mathematical framework um, is you would have your Oh, sorry. Maybe let's get to slide. We'll get to that. But yes, yeah, so this is kind of almost repeated uh, uh, what was on the previous slide. So we have our model, and we can observe. Um, we assume we can observe some uh, measurements from the system. Uh, these measurements must be. Uh, they might be sort of uh, noisy, and you might only be able to measure maybe a subset of the system variables. Or sometimes you can measure a linear combination of some of the system variables or things like that. So you basically have incomplete measurements, uh, which could be noisy. And what you want to do is you want to design the experimental inputs, um, obviously, to, to get the best um, parameter estimates you can. So to do this, we can set this up as basically an optimization problem. Um, but to obviously, if you want to uh, optimize this, you need some kind of objective. So the uh, commonly used one is um based on the fisher information uh so the fisher information um is a, the fisher information matrix is is basically defined like this uh where z is the sensitivity matrix so this tells you 
the sensitivity of the observable outputs with respect to the parameters. And the covariance matrix is basically the covariance um, in the outputs. Um, so just to get you know an ICZ intuitive understanding of this, if uh, you have one parameter and one observed output, this kind of reduces the, the whole matrix reduces down to just a single scalar value, um, which is one over the uncertainty. This kind of makes sense, right? If your measurement uncertainty is, uncertainty is lower, you're going to kind of gain more information about the system. And also maybe the more interesting part is the parameter sensitivity. So obviously if you increase the uh, the sensitivity of the output with respect to the parameters, um, that's going to help you distinguish between different parameterizations more effectively. Um, and then, you know, so, so usually we have this matrix and there's lots of metrics we can extract from this matrix. A commonly used one is just taking the determinant and that's called uh, D-optimal design. Um, and so then the problem is basically to maximize the, de the determinant of this matrix with respect to the experimental inputs. Um, so this is just kind of a cartoon of uh, basically a poorly designed experiment and a well-designed experiment. So a poorly designed experiment will have um, basically low uh, a low optimality score. So the determinant of the Fisher information matrix will be low. And that's going to lead you to high uncertainty in your parameters. So this is a confidence region. Um, you're going to have relatively high uncertainty in your parameters. Whereas a well-designed experiment might look very different. And um, that's going to give you high Fisher information or high uh, optimality score. Um, which will reduce the confidence region of your parameters, which is um, what we want. Uh, so a couple of ways you can do this. So um, these are kind of the sort of benchmark methods that uh, we use. They're not kind of the most sophisticated methods, but we'll, we'll kind of talk about um, that in a bit. So we looked at basically a one step ahead optimizer, um, which at each step of the experiment optimizes just with respect to the next step. Um, so it's kind of myopic. It doesn't have um, knowledge of kind of the, the full experiment at once. And then uh, we also have a model predictive controller, which is um, kind of uh, basically a, a better version of this because it can take into account what's going on across the whole experiment simultaneously. Um, so what you would do if you were going to use like an NPC to design your experiment is uh, use the, the model of the system uh, to design the experiment with your MPC, and then you can apply that experiment to the real system, and hopefully uh, you get some good characterization data. Um, so I probably don't need to introduce machine learning to this audience. Um, so obviously we're using reinforcement learning. I thought you probably know reinforcement learning better than I do, but um, we'll, we'll just go over it briefly, I guess. So obviously we have an agent that sort of lives in an in an environment and it interacts with its environment by undertaking these actions and then from the environment it can kind of observe it receives observations so it can kind of observe what's going on if it's observe the effects of its actions and it also gets this reward signal as well so and the the goal of the agent is to maximize its cognitive reward over time and um, which is called the return so very similar to training a dog right so you give a dog a reward and it's going to you can reinforce that behavior. Um, you can reinforce favorable behavior in that way. And as we all know, this is, uh, you know, there's lots of cool stuff that's been done with reinforcement learning. Um, okay, so how does this kind of fit into the optimal experimental design framework? Where it, it fits quite well because if we're doing kind of a model-based um, design of experiments, we would use the model to, to design the experiment and then apply that experiment to the real system. Uh, this fits quite well with reinforcement learning, where we can use the model to train an agent, and we can take that trained agent and apply it to uh, the real system. So, um, yeah, so we just set up kind of a, a reinforcement learning agent where the environment is just the uh, simulated model, and we can train it for those and those and those of episodes, uh, where each episode is a single simulated experiment. Um, and then we, in theory, which we haven't done yet, but we can take this trained agent and apply it to a real system um, and get good characterization data. So just to introduce the model that we've been primarily using for this paper. So um, uh, this is just a super simple model to kind of demonstrate 
the method we have applied this actually to a um, slightly more complex gene transcription model, uh, which we did take out the supplementary, but we will be putting back in in the in this round of revisions. Um, so, yeah. So the kind of scenario here is we we have an, we have a bacteria growing in a chemostat, which a chemostat just means there's constant. Um, the inflow and the outflow to the bioreactor are equal, so the volume remains constant. Um, and we kind of assume this bacteria has been engineered to be autotrophic. And what this means is it's basically deficient in a, in a nutrient, so usually an amino acid. Um, and this means uh, it requires this amino acid to grow. And so kind of the scenario here is we've engineered this autotrophic bacteria, and then we want to learn basically how it grows. We want to be able to model its growth. Um, as we know, the uh, metabolic network of an E. coli is extremely complex. So if you if you knock out part of its metabolism or part of its metabolic capability, it you know could have effects that you don't anticipate. Um, so basically, uh, so the actions are or the experimental inputs, they're kind of they're equivalent, are the nutrients that go into the reactor. So we have two nutrients, one carbon source and one um, oxytrophic nutrient. Um, and then the uh, the observable variable is the basically the density of the bacteria, so basically the population, um, which is quite easy to measure um, using optical density. And then there's basically three parameters that we're looking at in this model. So super simple. These are the differential equations. Um, um, but yeah, so it's a super simple model, but it is kind of it's sort of a realistic scenario where you might want to learn the growth parameters of uh, of an engineered strain of bacteria for example. And then the um, the kind of experiments we're looking at look like this. So we assume we're doing one 20 hour experiment um, where we can choose different inputs every two hours. Uh, so, you know, for each two hour time step, we have a, a different value for each of the two um, nutrients. And so this would constitute an experimental design. Um, so this is my rational design that I came up with. Turns out it's not very good. So. Um, and yeah, you know, you get some kind of output, right? So we have the population levels and we can measure the population levels. And we also have these hidden states of uh, the two nutrients, which we, which we cannot measure. Um, so I'm just gonna basically give kind of a truncated um, set of the results, basically just kind of the, the punchline um, or kind of the, the ones that I think are the cool, cooler results. There's, there's a few more results in the paper. Um, but yeah, so there's kind of this um, fundamental challenge in optimal experimental design in that if you have a nonlinear model, um, which in biology, everything's nonlinear, then the optimal experiment depends on your unknown system parameters. And obviously, you know, so obviously you can't know these parameters before you do a parameter inference experiment. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing the experiment in the first place, right? So. Um, this is kind of a, a challenge for the kind of mathematical based approaches, which are based on using the, the model to design the experiment, right? And there's a couple of ways around this. Uh, so what I call kind of the, the, the frequent or a couple of groups of ways, there's lots of different ways, or the frequentist or adaptive methods. Um, so basically here, you start from an initial guess, and then every time step in your experiment, uh, you basically update your parameter guess based on all the data you've gathered so far. And then you use your updated parameters to calculate your fissure information um, and uh, optimize with respect to the, the next experimental input. So obviously, you know, there's taking an initial guess of your parameters, that initial guess could potentially have quite a, an effect on your resulting experiment, especially if it's a bad guess, right? Um, and it's kind of not very elegant, I don't think. Um, and we also have kind of Bayesian methods. So obviously in uh, kind of Bayesian methodology, we would be able to um, choose a, a prior distribution over parameters, um, which is obviously a bit more expressive. We can incorporate kind of, you know, a distribution as opposed to a point es estimate. However, these can be um, really quite slow because you've got to integrate usually over multiple probability distributions. So do some kind of Monte Carlo like method. Um, or Markov chain like method, um, which can be a problem. So we're basically a kind of compelling reason or a compelling application is can we 
can we use reinforcement learning as an alternative to this? So our idea was, okay, can we choose a distribution um, in parameter space? So we just kind of used sort of a wide uniform distribution. Um, and then can we, during our training phase for our repeated experiments, can we for each episode sample from the parameter distribution? So each episode runs on a different parameterization of the environment, sample from the distribution, and you know, train that lots and lots of times. And then can we basically get an effective experimental controller that is able to adapt its experiment, uh, kind of basically depending on where it is in parameter space, okay? And this is quite compelling because, um, I mean, there's a couple of reasons, but one of them that's kind of apparent here is that um, unlike kind of the Bayesian methods, which are often limited to, to you know, Gaussian distributions, um, the only requirement of this distribution is that we're able to sample it. So it can potentially be quite complex and it can be multimodal and um, basically um, anything you want. So that's kind of the, the uh, basic idea. So um, the first thing we kind of looked at was um, is kind of isolating the basically learning the value function of the reinforcement learning agent. Um, so this can be thought of, sorry, that might be a bit small, but this can be thought of um, as learning the value function or can an agent predict the optimality of a given experiment um, without any knowledge of the parameters. So um, I've kind of, I've cut off kind of the, the first initial bit of work. So what, um, what we started off with in the paper is an agent that had this kind of optimization where we could, we also got the observed system measurements um, then we also got the current elements of the Fisher information matrix and the um, current time step. And we saw that this kind of show potential it kind of worked okay, not, not amazingly. Um, but the problem with this is that this is dependent on the parameter values. Um, so we wanted to kind of get rid of this. Um, so then we trained it, or we tested kind of a couple of different formulations. Um, we tested one basically as a negative control where we just took this out, right? Um, and then we tested agent three, which is the interesting one, where we replaced this um, with basically the full experimental trajectory. Okay, so um, if you're at time step T, you know everything that's happened before time step T, so every observation and every input that has got so far, um, as well as the current observation and the uh, time step. And the rationale behind this is that will give you some information about the dynamics of the system which can hopefully allow you to sort of do some kind of inference as to where you are in parameter space and adapt your experiment accordingly. Um, so the first test of this was, can we basically learn a good value function like this, um, which is sort of equivalent to predicting the, the optimality of a given experiment. Um, so uh, yeah, so sorry, this is a bit small, but the take home message of this is that Agent 3 um, basically works really well. It actually works better than um, agent one. So I think potentially there wasn't as much information encoded in the Fisher information matrix as, as we thought at the beginning. And actually this, this has worked super well. Okay. And, um, that, and like a couple of other things led us to sort of the, um, the kind of final, uh, architecture. Um, so this is kind of a, um, learning loop where we have the environment as the, the, uh, model, we get our experimental observations. Our reward is based on the Fisher information matrix, um, the determinant of the Fisher information matrix, and our action is the experimental input. Um, and yeah, so then, um, you know, so we, we developed basically a recurrent variant of the uh, T3D algorithm. Um, so basically how this works uh, is we've got our agent in the blue box, and then as probably a lot of you know, we, we keep all of our experience in a memory. And then we use the memory to update our value network. And then we can also update a policy network, which is, uh, you know, maps our observations to our experimental actions. Um, so our value network and policy network, they look very similar where we have a GIU layer to process the uh, sequences. Um, so the, the past things that have happened in the experiment. And we, um, yeah, so this bit here, as well as the um, 
experimental measurement of the current time step and the time step makes up our observation. Um, and then the value network also takes an action and outputs the predicted value. Um, and then the policy network looks very similar, but it doesn't take the um, action. So it just takes an observation and then outputs the action, which by the end of training should hopefully be close to optimal. Um, so then we can get kind of our, uh, we can basically test it on our kind of um, training loop where we sample, uh, we sample from the distribution um, each episode, we take a different sample. Um, we observe our experimental measurements. Uh, we get our Fisher information-based reward and we you know, perturb the system using our uh, experimental inputs. Uh, so this is just kind of the training graph and you can see um, as the episodes progress, we do learn um, pretty well. Um, so now, you know, we've, we've seen that we can basically train agents to increase the uh, optimality score, which is uh, this Fisher information-based metric. Um, however, the thing is we've got to test that um, this actually leads to better parameter estimates because uh, that's not necessarily guaranteed for a nonlinear system. Um, so we do this kind of throughout the paper and it does it, it does actually work quite well, but I'll just show you um, the results relevant to this specific one. Uh, so how we do this is we take our experimental designs um, and we generate basically 30 independent experiments and they're all got they all got measurement noise, so they're all you know slightly different. And then we fit parameters to each of our 30 experiments and we basically um, we can calculate. So in this in this case, we just calculate the average square error in the resulting parameter estimates. Um, so, and with the kind of hope that increased optimality score should lead to low error. Um, and in fact, that's what we see. So I've just got a rational design compared with a model predictive controller compared with the reinforcement learning agent. You can see it's much better. And then these are actually the 30 parameter samples ranked from uh, low to high error for each method. And you can see kind of the, the reinforcement learning is in blue. It's uh, consistently below the other methods. Okay, um, so we compared it to the one step ahead optimizer, a rational design, which is the one I came up with and an MPC, where the MPC is kind of the, uh, the main one we want to focus on. Um, uh, what I didn't tell you is this is actually kind of unfair to the MPC. And the reason for that is the MPC doesn't know anything about the parameter distribution, so it just takes a point estimate. Um, and this point estimate is just the center of the distribution, right? So the, this is this is quite unfair. So you know we can't just rely on this. Um, given that the agent can um, learn to or learn a good value function, you know, learn to predict experimental optimality across the distribution, as we've shown. Um, we would expect that it can also design experiments across the distribution. Um, so now we kind of just just confirm that. Um, and basically make the situation unfair in the other way. So now we test it against an MPC that has um, prior knowledge, so unrealistic prior knowledge of the parameters um, at each parameter sample. And we just compare the optimality scores. Um, so you can see here, the, the blue is the reinforcement learning and the red is the MPC. If we take this MPC is basically, um, you know, this is an MPC with complete um, prior knowledge uh, so this is basically the gold standard and we can see that we're you know not not much lower so uh, we're doing pretty well there we think um so that all looks good um one thing that's quite interesting i think is to look at the kind of the resulting experiments um so what you might expect is that um well there's two there's two kind of different things that might be going on here um it might, uh, we might just be learning kind of an average experiment that works quite well across a whole distribution, like a, like a compromise. Um, or as kind of implied by the previous results, we might expect that the agent can use the dynamics of the system to kind of, and learn to adapt to where it is in parameter space. And what you might, um, what you would expect if this was happening was some kind of similarity in the experiments in the early phase, um, because in the early phase, it doesn't have any uh, kind of knowledge with which it can adapt its behavior to. Uh, 
Um, whereas in the later phases, these experiments might diverge a bit more. Um, so this is actually what we see. So for different parameter samples, um, uh, you know, we we can look at the experiments that we that we design across these different samples. And we actually see that for the first three inputs, um, the experiments are exactly the same. And then after that, the experiments kind of start to diverge a bit more. Oh, they don't diverge, diverge like massively. So I think, uh, well, my kind of theory is that this is uh, because the model structure is the same. So I think there might be like a core experimental design that's sort of dictated by the model structure. And then we kind of diverge from this a little bit, depending where we are in parameter space. So I think it'd be super interesting to look at um, maybe like a model discrimination task where you have two structurally different models, um, see whether they have kind of like different uh, fundamentally different experiments, which then within their parameter spaces, uh, you see slight variations from. Um, so just to kind of, you know, we haven't really talked about why we might want to use reinforcement learning as opposed to these other methods. So um, in terms of kind of the advantages and disadvantages, um, obviously the, the disadvantage of reinforcement learning is it requires training beforehand, okay, which the other ones don't. Um, which could potentially be um, quite long. So the training in this work was actually um, only about 12 hours, um, which is you know very doable. But then we are working on a super simple model and we don't know how how this scales, right? We that's kind of left for future work at the minute. Um, so that's kind of the downside, but we do get some a couple of really compelling upsides from that. Um, one of those is that kind of the real time speed for your online experimental design is extremely fast, right? It's because you've already trained your agent and all you need to do is um, do the forward pass of a neural network, um, which I actually tested this just on my uh, desktop. It's like 0 0.005 seconds, right? Whereas for kind of a more adaptive method, these aren't, aren't too slow, but you still have to do a parameter optimization uh, task and then the experimental optimization for each time step. And obviously Bayesian, you know, you're talking like uh, much slower than that. Um, so we actually, uh, this is kind of one of the motivations for some experimental work we should be doing. So I actually had a meeting yesterday with Nicholas uh, Cruz's lab. So they read this paper and, got, and contacted us about uh, implementing it in their experimental um this setup because they've got like uh really cool kind of high throughput automated uh, bio lab basically and this is the 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 reason they um were interested in really is because they're using one of these uh sort of adaptive methods and they found that kind of the speed is is too slow basically so they, they can't calculate experimental inputs fast enough um so that's quite cool and then um the other thing that's quite cool is it's very easy to incorporate prior knowledge because we just need to sample from um, a distribution. Um, so in kind of adaptive methods, if you're taking just a point estimate, you know, there are different ways of doing this, but can be very limited and quite difficult. And obviously Bayesian methods, you you know, you can look at uh, the prior distributions and distributions over parameters and noise distributions, but you can be limited in, you know, to Gaussians and things like that. Um, so this is cool, and it also it would make it quite trivial to look at you know distributions over structurally different models, um, each with distributions over parameters, and you know because you can just sample from from that distribution. Um, so that's kind of just you know in a hopefully in a nutshell gives you a good idea of what um, what we did in this paper. Um, so we've shown that we can use RL to design optimal experiments, and we can incorporate prior information uh, by sampling. Uh, so some of the kind of interesting next steps we could look at, you know, basically just sample from more distributions, I think. So look at models of random components. Again, you can learn by sampling, model discrimination. There's a couple of ways we can do this. Uh, we can also look at different kind of reward metrics. So instead of just the, um, the optimal design, there's, you know, not loads and loads of ways we can do that. And uh, maybe now, as of yesterday, uh, the uh, kind of most exciting thing that sh should hopefully be happening soon is we're going to be working with uh, Nicholas Cruz to hopefully integrate this method into their high throughput experimental pipeline, which would be super cool to do because I uh, 
in case it wasn't clear, this was all a simulation study. So we haven't um, we haven't applied this in real life yet. Um, so that's it. Just want to obviously say thank you to everyone at the Barnes Lab at UCL and also the Ingalls Lab. So um, obviously Brian and Nate, Nate Braniff, who is now at the University of Chicago, I believe, but he was super, super helpful in uh, basically teaching me how to my experimental design. Um, and basically, I, I was able to go to the University of Waterloo on a Vogue Fellowship and the ERC uh, has funded a lot of this research. Um, so yeah, thanks for listening and obviously uh, happy to take any questions. Hopefully that made sense. Amazing talk, uh, Nathan. Thank you so much. I think there is a question in the chat from Haim. Uh, uh, hang on. Uh, Haim, would you like to ask it by by voice or? I'm trying to find the chat. Uh, oh. I can read it otherwise. Um, um, thank, thanks a lot for the talk. Very interesting. Have you applied the RL method on eukaryotic samples and vertebrae? Have I applied this method on eukaryotic samples? Yeah. Uh, no, so we, we've we only looked at kind of this kind of simple bioreactor model and then also kind of a model of gene transcription. Um, there's the only two we've looked at at the minute, but in, in principle, you can apply it to any model that's a set of differential equations um, at the moment. Those, the, that should be kind of um, easy. You can just kind of write a set, set of differential equations and slot it in, and hopefully it should all work. Uh, so it's quite general in that regard. And we also have another question from James, uh, asking whether you have any public code for this project. Uh, yeah, I should have put my GitHub on up there. Um, yeah, so let me just, uh, I can probably post uh, paste my GitHub into the chat. Oh, yeah, I found the chat. Sorry. Ah, uh, yeah, I'll paste that in now. So, um, I can't promise that it's, I mean, it's relatively tidy, but it's not kind of written up as, uh, like a software package or anything. Um, that's kind of something we're thinking about. I guess we'll see how it goes when we implement it. And then if that's successful, we can uh, maybe think about developing like a proper package. I don't know which parameters to pick for the RL. Um, well, so so that's, um, uh, do you mean kind of the, the actual learning parameters for the reinforcement learning? I mean, it honestly wasn't that difficult to change. So the actual, uh, reinforcement learning is maybe quite simple. So the, these, you know, the networks that we're using are super small. So it's a GRU layer with um, a GRU cell with two layers of 64 neurons and then a feed forward bit with two layers of 128 neurons. Um, so I actually kind of just use sort of standard parameters from the T2D algorithm and then did a, you know, like a grid search through a few different uh, layer size options. Um, but then I found that, you know, working with the chemostat model, I didn't have to change the parameters at all going to the uh, gene transcription model and it just worked. So it seemed relatively robust and not, uh, that part wasn't actually very difficult. So compared to like, you know, some of the other projects, I guess you've seen where the reinforcement learning problem is a huge um, thing. The reinforcement learning problem is uh, almost deliberately, we try and keep it quite small just so that you know, the barrier to entry, if if other people want to run it, is not as big, if that makes sense. Because we, we want it to be used in bio labs who don't always have, you know, like 10 GPUs to run a huge transformer network on and things like that. Awesome. I, I, I may um, add one more question, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think you've mentioned that uh, it, it takes about one day uh, in terms of uh, sample efficiency for the algorithm to learn. Uh, do you think um, 
one day is like sufficiently so, fast or would it be important to improve uh, further? So that was that was actually the previous paper. So the oh, okay. bioreactor control paper was about one day. I think that's, um, so it's one day on five parallel bioreactors. That's, yeah, super doable, right? You can, so in Nicholas's lab, for example, you can do way, way more than that. You can run like, you know, 100 in parallel for a day quite easily. Um, so for this one, the, the sample efficiency isn't really a con or as much of a concern because you're, you're training on the model anyway. So you do all your training on the model. Um, so the only real concern there is, you know, if you're, if we go up to more complex models and it takes like 10 years to train on a cluster, mm -hmm. obviously that's going to be a problem, right? But um, in terms of like, uh, there's no kind of constraints on like sample efficiency because of experimental constraints really. Um, I see. Yeah. But if you, if you mean kind of the the resulting experiment, um, that's less of a of a concern because you don't need to train on the real system. You just take the trained agent and apply it. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. Thank you very much. Yeah, of course, of course. Okay. Anyone has any other questions for Nathan? Um, okay, so in the future, so as I said, we're um, we're hopefully going to be implementing this uh, kind of in real life, right? Maybe um, hopefully both the control and the optimal experiment is the design. Um, so if, if that all goes well, I think um, well, a couple of things I want to do is maybe make it into a package so that you know other people can use it easily. And then the other thing is, I think we need to investigate how well it scales to larger models because the um, the two models we've looked at at the minute are relatively small. Um, so that's going to be interesting, right? It's, it's basically how how well does the training time scale? I think uh, so. That would be quite an important uh, question. Awesome. Uh, if there are no other questions, I think we can wrap up then. Um, oh, cool. Yeah. Thanks, um, everyone, for listening. Thanks for uh, voting for my paper. It's a, it's a pleasure. Uh, the thanks goes to you, in fact, for the fantastic talk. I will stop the recording now. Mm -hmm.